Welcome back to CoreM, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Brian Gilberti. And this is Breed C. Just as a precursor, in accordance with COVID guidelines, we're all wearing masks in the studio, so apologies in advance if we sound a bit muffled. Anyhow, what are we talking about this week, Brian? It's going to be one of those can't-miss diagnoses, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And luckily, we're joined by one of our very own senior EM residents, Mark Isco. Right. We're so, so excited that you're joining us, Mark. Mark is originally from Washington, D.C., and he'll be taking his talents to Yale this summer for a clinical informatics fellowship. Welcome to Corey M, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course, Mark. So tell us why you chose this topic. Well, I recently presented a morning report case on subarachnoid hemorrhage. A healthy young woman came in with AMS and ended up deteriorating quickly. She needed to be intubated before we even made the diagnosis. This topic gets at some core emergency medicine principles in a couple ways. First, it can be a hard diagnosis to make if you're not planning on CTing and LPing everyone. But it's a so-called can't-miss one because it can have devastating consequences. And second, patients with subarachnoid hemorrhages can come in or become critically ill. And proper management requires not only skilled resuscitation, but also simultaneous consideration of multiple organ systems and often coordination between multiple services. Agreed. It's a bad diagnosis, but one where we have the opportunity to really change a patient's course for the better. Okay, let's start briefly with some terminology. Today we'll be talking about atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages rather than traumatic subarachnoids. The large majority of these, around 85%, are due to rupture of an intracranial aneurysm. Sometimes we'll use the term subarachnoid hemorrhage as shorthand, but spontaneous aneurysmal subarachnoids are what we're really discussing. As the name suggests, this is bleeding into the subarachnoid space. That's the space between the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater, which is the same space that the CSF occupies. So Mark, do all these patients present with the worst headache ever? Boom, we're done? We could only hope. Some of these patients will come into the hospital in critical condition, or with new neurologic deficits, or yes, with a classic story. A severe, thunderclap, worst headache of the patient's life, associated with brief loss of consciousness, and then later with vomiting and neck stiffness. These are the easy ones to diagnose. All right, great. Podcast done. Cue the music. Got it. Ha, not so fast. Before we get into the good stuff, let's talk about patients with subtler presentations. I mean, one thing that makes it so hard is that headaches are a frequent presenting complaint in the ED. They account for roughly 2% of total ED visits. And only a small proportion of these, maybe 1-3%, to are due to aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And to make it more challenging, as many as half of the patients who come to the ED with a headache due to subarachnoid hemorrhage will be alert and neurologically intact. They may look similar to patients with more common and benign diagnoses, such as migraine or tension headache. As a result, around 5% of subarachnoid hemorrhages are missed on initial ED presentation. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yes, it is, especially as a soon-to-be new attending. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a devastating diagnosis. Numbers vary, and outcomes do seem to be gradually improving, but it is fatal before hospital arrival in maybe 10 to 15% of patients. And among those who do make it to the hospital, an additional 20 to 40% will die in the first month. Early diagnosis allows for early intervention and can significantly improve outcomes. So it's helpful to know who to work up. It's also helpful to keep in mind a differential of some other dangerous, rare types of headaches that could be masquerading as a subarachnoid. So cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, intracranial infections, increased ICP, and reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, just to name a few. Yeah, I mean, we can look at risk factors, but that only gets you so far. They're most common in the fifth and sixth decades of life, though they can happen at any age. Risk factors include smoking, family history, hypertension, and sympathomimetic drug use. Mark, any decision rules you like to use? Yeah, there's one called the Ottawa Subarachnoid Hemorrhage Rule, which was published in 2013 and then subsequently validated both internally and externally. It's worth talking about briefly because it does have excellent sensitivity. Probably the biggest shortcomings are poor specificity and narrow applicability. Sorry, gotta do my obligatory, it's Canadian shout out. Yeah, I gotta say the best rules are usually Canadian. Okay, so Mark, walk us through the rule. Well, the six criteria include age of 40 or greater, neck pain or stiffness, witnessed loss of consciousness, onset with exertion, a true thunderclap headache, which they define as peaking within one second of onset, and limited neck flexion on exam. 
If patients meet any of these criteria, they cannot be ruled out. But if the answer is no to all of them, then you can probably be assured that their headache is not caused by a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Little tip, I always tell our medical students to try not to literally ask, so was this the worst thunderclap headache of your entire life? Because that's priming, and for someone in the ED, this probably does feel like the worst headache of their life. I like to ask things like, so how long did it take to get to the most painful level? Or have you had headaches that feel like this before? I like that. It all makes sense. As with any decision rule, it's good to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. To be included, patients were required to be at least 16 years old, alert with a GCS of 15, and to complain of either a traumatic headache that peaked within one hour, not one second, or of syncope associated with headache. And the headache had to be acute, defined as starting less than 14 days before presentation. Wow, that's good to know. I don't think I would have defined a headache starting 13 days before an ED visit as necessarily acute. Can you tell us about who was excluded, Mark? Sure. They excluded a lot of patients. Patients were excluded if they were transferred in for a subarachnoid hemorrhage diagnosed at an outside facility, if they were returning for further evaluation of a headache for which they'd already undergone a CT or LP, if they had three or more similar headaches in the past year, if they had papilledema, if they had new neurodeficits, or if they had a history of subarachnoid hemorrhage, cerebral aneurysm, hydrocephalus, or intracranial neoplasm. Got it. Okay, so let's say we decide to work up this patient for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Where do we start? Well, I think like a lot of us, I'd say a non-con head CT to start. And if a patient presents early enough, a negative non-con head CT can also be where your workup ends, at least for this diagnosis. And tell us why that is. Well, in 2011... Our trusty Canadians, Perry et al., published data from a large prospective study conducted over the previous decade looking at the sensitivity of non-contrast head CT in diagnosing subarachnoid. They enrolled a total of over 3,000 patients who had intact neurological exams and new acute headaches that peaked within an hour of onset. In other words, patients who you might be moderately concerned for are subarachnoid. Exactly. And about 8% of these patients did end up having a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Overall, sensitivity of head CT was around 93%. Not bad. But among the 900 or so patients who were scanned within six hours of headache onset, the sensitivity was 100%, with a 95% confidence interval of 97 to 100%. And the negative predictive value was 99.5% to 100%. Subsequent studies have found similar, if not quite as high, sensitivities. A 2016 meta-analysis found a sensitivity of 98.7%. That's pretty good, and for most of us, that may be enough for a neurointact patient, of course. But it could also lead to a discussion with the patient about diagnostic uncertainty and the risks and benefits of performing NLP, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Just a caveat here. To reach this high level of sensitivity, the scans should be done with modern CT scanners and read by attending level radiologists. And Mark, going back to that six-hour window you mentioned before, what if we're outside that? Traditional teaching follows the algorithm of staged CT and lumbar puncture to rule out subarachnoid. You start with a non-contrast head CT, and if that's negative, you proceed to a lumbar puncture, looking for xanthochromia and elevated RBCs. All right, guys, you know, this is a safe space for all of us here in the studio, so I'm going to go ahead and be honest with both of you and admit that there have been a couple of CSF tubes from my LPs over the years that have had a couple of RBCs floating around in them. And that's why Brian has never tasted champagne. Well, traumatic taps do happen, and unfortunately, there are no agreed-upon cutoffs for red cells in the CSF. If the presence of RBCs is due to a traumatic tap rather than a bleed, the RBC count should drop substantially between the first and last tubes of CSF. One large case series found that you could essentially exclude the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage if the RBC count in the final tube is less than 100 cells per microliter. Another study found that a cutoff of 2,000 RBCs was very sensitive for aneurysmal subarachnoid. Whatever your RBC cutoff, a traumatic tap should not cause xanthochromia. Mark, tell us more about xanthochromia. Xanthochromia is the yellow discoloration of CSF caused by the presence of bilirubin, a byproduct of the degradation of heme. It forms 6 to 12 hours after blood enters the CSF and then persists for quite a while, at least a couple of weeks. Your lab will spin down the CSF sample and examine the supernatant for xanthochromia, either through visual inspection or spectrophotometry. 
And what is spectrophotometry anyways? Well, spectrophotometry is a... No, just kidding. Stop pimping Mark, Brian. Okay, what about CTA? Why don't we just CTA everybody? CTA is an appealing alternative to LP as a follow-up test for a negative CT head for both physicians and patients. LPs are invasive, and they can be painful, both during and after the procedure, in the form of a post-LP headache. And anecdotally, this is a procedure that incites a lot of fear in patients. And they can be time-consuming as well, not really something that you're going to be jumping to if you've got a busy board. Right, they can be time-consuming. CTA, while maybe studied somewhat less robustly than LP, probably also has great sensitivity for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage at 99% or higher, and it's in many ways simpler. Well, that's pretty good. So why not just CTA everybody after getting a CT head? Well, as with any CT, there are the risks associated with radiation, though for a head CT, this is relatively small. We also have to consider IV contrast. Another risk to consider with a CTA is the possibility of identifying an incidental aneurysm in a patient without a bleed. Aneurysms are present in around 2% of the population, and the vast majority never rupture. This can lead to unnecessary downstream workup procedures and their complications, not to mention patients getting very anxious. You also be mindful of taking up the CT scan in your ED, especially if you have multiple traumas, strokes, and other patients who need it. MRI may also be a good alternative, but there's much less data here. Okay, so CT head, if more than six hours, likely LP. And don't forget shared decision-making before the LP. It's helpful to share the numbers, likelihood, pros and cons of LPs, especially in patients with who you have a very low pretest suspicion anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. So what if the study is positive? Now for the exciting stuff. If the patient is critically ill, as always, start with stabilization and resuscitation, your ABCDs. And sometimes this happens before the diagnosis is made. You might suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage in a patient who called EMS for a headache and then rolls in seizing, for example. But that patient's not going straight to the scanner. Right. And just for a review, A is for airway. A patient who can't protect their airway likely needs to be intubated. B is for breathing. You want to avoid both hypoxia and hyperoxia. C is for circulation. Resuscitate and get multiple points of IV access. These patients will often require multiple medications, including drips. And blood pressure management is key. More on that later. In subarachnoid hemorrhage, the D for disability is a big part of your ABCDs. That will be the main focus of the rest of the episode. Before we get into that, you can also think about D for disposition here. If you're at a hospital that has neurosurgery or neuro-IR, get your patient to the ICU or the OR or the IR suite. If you aren't, start working early on getting them to a center that can definitively manage their aneurysm and take the necessary steps to stabilize them first. Any tips on how to assess how severe the subarachnoid is, Mark? Yes, there are a few common grading scores for subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they can be helpful if you're trying to quantify a patient's disability. The Hunt-Hess grade is a straightforward 1 to 5 scale that classifies patients based on symptoms. Patients who are asymptomatic or have only a mild headache are grade 1. Patients who are comatose or have extensor posturing are 5. Most patients fall somewhere in the middle. It can be applied quickly, And it can help you not only communicate with consultants, but also risk stratify your patients. So this sounds like an excellent tool when coordinating care with other teams and determining the level of care that's required for the patient. Now, Mark, can you tell us how it's applied clinically? Patients with a hunt test grade of 1 or 2 have around 3% mortality. Grade 3 for confusion, lethargy, or lateralized weakness brings you closer to 10%. Grade 4 for stupor carries a mortality of nearly a quarter. And finally, around 70% of patients with a hunt test grade of 5 for coma will die. Short of mortality, there is significant morbidity associated with this diagnosis. In some ways, patients who fall into those middle grades are the scariest cases. These are people with a lot to lose, and your management can do a lot to affect and hopefully improve their outcomes. And after stabilization, the mainstays of management can fit into two big categories, prevention of rebleeding and reducing cerebral injury. Definitive management for an aneurysmal bleed entails aneurysm repair, and that happens through either endovascular coiling or surgical clipping. Time is of the essence, and you want to consult neurosurgery and IR as soon as you have this diagnosis. Side note, you'll want to reverse anticoagulation according to your institutional protocols. 
You can also consider platelet transfusions for patients taking antiplatelet agents, though this is controversial. Extrapolation of data from the literature on intracerebral hemorrhage suggests that this may do some harm. The decision of whether or not to transfuse platelets can be made in conjunction with neurosurgery. Great, Mark. And another point that I think we should cover here in this podcast is TXA. Is there a role for TXA in these patients? Yeah, there's biologic plausibility for why an antifibrinolytic like TXA could help here. But at this point, the data do not support improvements in outcomes with TXA administration, and it is not routinely used. Great. So that's how to reduce rebleeding. While you work on definitive management, what steps can you take to reduce cerebral injury from the bleeding that's already happened? Blood pressure management is key. And avoiding severe hypertension may also help reduce the risk of rebleeding. But you also want to avoid hypotension. These patients are at risk for ischemic infarction. When managing blood pressure, keep in mind cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the difference between MAP and ICP. You want to be in that BP sweet spot. What kind of goals are we talking about, Mark? Blood pressure goals have largely been extrapolated from the literature on intracerebral hemorrhage. The joint guidelines of the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association say that it's reasonable to target a systolic blood pressure below 160. Consultants will often recommend a lower systolic goal, say 150 or even 140. But just know that the guideline recommendation is somewhat higher. And what drugs should we use to reach that goal? Common agents are labetalol and nicardipine. Clavidipine, a very short-acting calcium channel blocker, can also be used. In patients with difficult-to-control or labile pressure, an arterial line may be helpful. There isn't a strict guideline on the rate of decreasing blood pressure in subarachnoid hemorrhage, but you should be standing by your patient while giving antihypertensives. And remember, you can always start small and keep titrating. Yeah, great point. Remember that cerebral perfusion pressure depends on ICP as well as systemic pressure. Subarachnoid hemorrhage can increase ICP through a number of mechanisms. Blood fills the subarachnoid space, then the blood products can impair CSF drainage, leading to obstructive hydrocephalus. The hemorrhage also causes low inflammation and impairs autoregulation. So Mark, how can we help mitigate ICP increases? You want to keep the patient's head of bed elevated to 30 degrees with their head midline. You want to minimize pain and adequately sedate intubated patients. Increased ICP can be medically managed with hypertonic saline or with osmotic diuresis. But more commonly, when there's evidence of increased ICP or hydrocephalus, the issue is dealt with surgically by placement of an external ventricular drain, or EVD, which has the dual purpose of diverting CSF and measuring ICP in real time. Some patients with significant edema will require a craniectomy. And Keppra may have a role here as seizure prophylaxis, but there isn't much robust data to support this practice. Yep, and consider starting the calcium channel blocker nemotipine within 48 hours, which has been repeatedly shown to improve outcomes in subarachnoid. And finally, as anyone who has read a neurosurgery note can tell you, your goal is you, that's EU, everything. Euvolemia, eunatremia, euglycemia, euthermia, and uh, euoxygenation. Essentially, you want to avoid anything being too high or too low to minimize additional cerebral injury. So Mark, how did your young, healthy woman end up doing? Thankfully, she did quite well. She went for endovascular coiling that night, and now she's back at home with her family and back at work. Amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, time for some take-home points. Hit it, Mark. Subarachnoid hemorrhage carries a high mortality, and it can be a tough diagnosis to make. You can use the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule to rule out this diagnosis, but it has limited applicability. In the right patient population, a normal non-contrast head CT within six hours of symptom onset essentially excludes this diagnosis. Outside of that time window, follow a negative non-con head CT with either an LP or a CTA. You can use the Hunt-Hess scale to quickly grade severity and assess prognosis. And finally, the mainstays of management stabilization, prevention of re-bleeding, and reduction of cerebral injury. Mark, thanks so much for being here and joining us in the studio. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. And that's all for this episode. Continue to follow us on Twitter at core underscore EM and visit us on our website, coreem.net. Until the next one, this is Bree, Brian, and Mark signing off.